Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Smart Things. Smart Things lets you monitor, control, and automate your home from wherever you are using your smartphone. Right now, Smart Things is offering Know How listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit. And get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. On this episode of Know How, we're bringing back some Instamorph, uh, a little bit from CES 2015. Oh, and uh, building a home router. Ready for this? Ready for this? Just don't knock anything off the table. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and go back to our title screen. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 45 to 50 minutes, we're going to be taking you some of the projects that we've been doing so that uh, you can geek out on your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been uh, having a good time this week, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank Anthony, who's running the board today, for uh, hopping in and helping us with this pre-record we're doing. Yes, and uh, normally we have Alex, and Alex knows knows there the whole whole deal. The man in uh, the shadows. He's, he's doing us a big favor by doing this. He oh, I'm is sorry. All I'm the sorry. buttons back there. He likes all of the buttons. So. <laughs> oh, 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 I did it again. Sorry. This, this should be an interesting. He's episode. messing with us. He, very much so. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, because this is a pre-record, this is going to sound a little bit old. But last week, because remember, we're in the future. Yes. That's the last time we're going to mention that it's a pre-record. <laughs> uh, Last week, they released, a, by, completely by surprise, a brand new version of the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, so this is pretty exciting, because uh, there has been a couple of versions that have been released, yes. but they've been minor. You know, there, a, a few things got moved around, but there hasn't been a big upgrade to the Raspberry Pi like with the CPU and stuff like that until now. Right, so if you look at, you look at the overhead, this is the original Raspberry Pi. So this is the one that uh, people got when they were first playing around with the platform. It's very so cute. Very okay. competent, very capable. Our projects were built around this. So uh, we built the Tor um, router based on this. We, we built the did. main machine based yes. on this. We've had a lot of fun with this little guy. It's it's much more powerful than its small stature would uh, let you think. Right. Uh, but, you know, there were a few things wrong that they fixed in the B version. So they doubled the amount of memory to half a gig. They increased the number of GPIO headers so that you could do more things with it. Ooh, yeah. They increased the number of USB ports from two to four, and they changed the... Uh, the SD slot, the thing here where the cards would go, mm -hmm. from standard SD, which would fall out all the time, yes. to the push-push micro SD slots. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, last week, they upped it even more. No one what? knew this was coming, but they've now got the Raspberry Pi 2. This thing... <laughs> Is cool. It uses a Broadcom BCM 2836 900 megahertz quad core SOC. That's a system on a chip. So it's roughly four times faster. Actually, no, roughly 12 times faster than the original. It's got one gigabyte of memory. Uh, it they added again more uh, more of those general I/O pins. So they kept all of the uh, the changes from the original version to the B. And uh, now, here's, here's actually something that's very cool. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been using the Raspi for Internet of Things projects, right? Yeah, tying things together. Yeah. Um, I know Aaron Newcomb's been doing some home automation stuff with his. Right, because it's so inexpensive. It's 35 bucks. And by the way, the new version is 35 bucks. So no, because that was going to be the thing. I, yeah. That's the part of the reason why they kept saying they weren't updating it, because they wanted to keep costs at the same level. Which, it's kind of strange, because they're going to price the new one at 35 but the old one is also going to be 35. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to change. That's, yeah. that's going to change at some point. But the idea is that the new one should cost you $35. They want to keep this in incredibly low. Right. The reason why they made this, Brian, and, and you know this, there's been a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, the Raspberry Pi is cool. I like yeah. to build projects. But, you know, it's underpowered. I can't really. I could use it as a MAME. Yes. But I'm not going to use it as my primary PC. It, just, yeah. it doesn't really have the oomph. I was able to do things like stream video off of this. But... It was always kind of low frame rate. It, it was, great. it was. And I, I did a few times try loading a, um, 
I forget what distribution it was on the, a, li a Linux distribution, just to use it as like a little computer to do some web browsing and stuff. And it was painful to try and do any web browsing yeah. or play videos yeah. and stuff like that. So, so the extra speed should alleviate some of that. But here's the super crazy, ridiculously exciting thing: Windows 10, mm -hmm. right? It's being released. Yep. Microsoft is making it free for anyone who's making an Internet of Thing device. This is considered an Internet of Things device, which means you'll be able to run a version of Windows 10 on this. Now, it's not designed what? to be what? a desktop OS, yeah. right? It's designed to be like your sensor. It just happens to use Windows. Right. But that's actually pretty big news. That is really cool. Yeah. And I, <laughs> uh, I think I know what I'm going to be playing with uh, in a few weeks. Yeah, we're gonna have to. We have to get get a couple of versions of this thing. Yes. Uh, we're gonna have to get. I, I know of someone we can call for the Windows 10 Internet of Things version. That would be kind of cool. But I, I think in the future, uh, devices like this will always have a place. This is not what I prefer to use when I have a mission critical need. Like for example, to keep a quadcopter in the air. I would never mm -hmm. use a Raspi because you know it's gonna crash. It's a general purpose computer. But anytime I want to gather data and I don't have to worry about like if it has to reboot, this is a fantastically price efficient device to use. Yeah, well, um, wasn't it one of the projects we did, sol a solar panel? A sol solar panel? Yeah, uh, and actually uh, I still have that running. I should, I should bring that back because yeah. I, I hooked up a solar panel with a Raspi along with a battery so that it would tide it over when there was no sun. Right. That thing has been running for I think six months straight. <laughs> uh, and all it's been doing is it takes pictures. So actually that memory card's probably full. <laughs> I put a 64 gigabyte memory, or a 32 gigabyte memory card in the yeah. thing. It was taking low res pictures, but I think it might be it's full by now. At this point, probably. Yeah. But that, that's the kind of project that you would do, you know? Right. It, something cheap, something you're not, you know, too, too worried about destroying, or uh, it's something critical. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Uh, uh, pick one of these up. They're going to be on sale. Just go online, look for the Raspberry Pi. It's the new version, 35 bucks. It's great to have in your toolkit. Speaking yes. of things that are great to have in your toolkit, we did something here on Know How a while back that was uh, uh, fun. It was a lot of fun. We've done a lot of things on the show. No, but this fun. one was really fun. How fun? Remember you were making a <gasps> little... Uh... Okay, that was really fun. Okay, that now fun. this is Instamorph. We played with this on the show, mm -hmm. and uh, you remember what it is. These are just pellets. If you go to the overhead cam, th this is all it looks like. So this is just mm -hmm. a bunch of plastic pellets, and the idea is when it melts... This is some hot water, hopefully, that stayed hot. It turns transparent, and it actually gloms together. It creates, uh, like, so this is, is some... That, is that the technical term? Yeah, like glomming? It's glomming, glomming. Like, for example, <laughs> uh, hopefully it's still warm enough. I'm going to pour some additional pellets here, and pretty quickly, if the water's warm enough, you should start to see them turn from uh, white to clear. When it turns clear, it means that uh, it's, now, it's now ready to be molded. Now, the cool thing about this is for like fast prototyping. So whenever I need something that can be turned into something else really quickly, yes. this is something that you want to use. Now, you use this to make your little <laughs> claim. Yeah, it. it brought back some ch uh, childhood memories. I made my little army dudes out of it. Uh, but we also talked about maybe using it to, for, as like uh, landing skids for our right. quadcopters and right. stuff like that. Which is actually what I've been doing. I've been playing a lot with Instamorph and it, I, I have to say, if you need something done in a hurry and you don't want to wait for a part or buy a part. Can I play with it now? Oh, uh, uh, it's hot, it's ah. hot. Okay, ah. Let, let's go over some tips because okay. we, this, is, this is a bit more advanced than just modeling it together. All right. There's a few things that I've learned over the last couple of months playing with Instamorph. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that it's going to pick up your fingerprints. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's actually really good at that. So if you, if you uh, are playing with this at all and you want to create a nice finished surface, it's very important to use gloves. So I, I gave you a pair of, uh, these are nitrile. Uh, you could also get latex or whatever you need in order not to have an, an allergic reaction. But this will essentially take your fingerprints out of the, uh, out of the equation, which are is Are you good. worried about people copying those fingerprints or something? No, I just, you know, yeah. I just, I like, you want... I want the finish to be right, right? right. If I'm making okay. a part, I don't want my fingerprints all, all over it. it. Yeah, okay, uh, okay. And, and this also makes it easier to work with because it can get kind of gummy and you don't want it sticking to your hands. Yeah, it can get kind of gummy. Um, yeah. But the, I mean, the coolest thing about it is it feels just like clay or it, you can mold it just like clay, but it does have like a smooth plastic kind of texture. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, now this, one of the cool things about Instamorph is that you can reuse it over and over and over again. That's the whole idea. Uh, but one quick note is when you reuse it, it starts to pick up 
anything that it's been exposed to. So as you can mm. see, like compare the color it's of this of, and the new pellets. These are like perfectly clear and this one's kind of Yeah, yeah so just gray. be careful with that because that's gonna happen. I mean, uh, so just just know that if you reuse it, mm -hmm. eventually it's just gonna become discolored like crazy. I don't I don't really care about this for this project, Yeah. but uh, that's that's something to know. Have you tried dyeing these yet? Yes, uh, you have to be, you have to dye it a long time to make so, it. Oh really, so you gotta just let it sit in yeah. food coloring for a yeah. long time in hot I guess you have to keep it hot the whole time, too, yeah. huh? Uh, something else is, so I have this in a plastic container, which means it's going to glom to the bottom, so you got to be careful. It's, it's best to use glass. I, I like to use plastic every once in a while just because it makes it a little easier to handle. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're cutting this stuff, this, this is actually uh, really, really important. I, I lost my cutting board. Uh, so I'm going to use the back of the Gizwiz sign here. Uh, no, no, <laughs> they don't I, need I, it. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Uh, uh, there's, there's something you should uh, actually... Uh, if, while I keep talking, could you grab it? It's in the kitchen. It's a white. All whiteboard. right, I'll be right back. I'm everyone. sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that I learned about uh, Instamorph is that it helps to have tools that have curves. Uh, the problem with using something like this, so this is a standard box cutter, is as you drag this across the surface of the Instamorph, it tends to grab it and then pull it. And what will happen is you'll end up just elongating the surface rather than than making a clean cut. You don't want to make a lot of lateral motion. You want to make sort of down motion. Now, the down motion is normally okay for, for large blades, but uh, for a lot of the curved shapes, it's hard to do. So uh, let me demonstrate what, what I mean by that. Uh, let's go ahead and use the whiteboard surface. That gonna... is the thing I was supposed to find, right? Yeah, yeah. That's not <laughs> someone else's stuff. So if I put this down like that, mm -hmm. and then I try to cut it with this, what's going to happen is rather than doing a cut, it's just kind of... Oh, kind of bend yeah, it. It's, it's, it's just like, it's not really cutting, and if I try to put more pressure, it just starts stretching it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's not good, uh, obviously, because it's just going to destroy the shape mm -hmm. of whatever it is I'm, I'm trying to do. What I can do it instead, let me go ahead and... Re Mold it and to it your back. will. Get it back to the heat. I need, <laughs> I need more heat. Maybe I should have grabbed some of that while I was in the kitchen. I brought some extra here. I can use this. This is a rotary cutter. So that's like a box cutter, but it has a circular blade. So pizza cutter. There you go. See? Uh, this is not a pizza cutter. This, oh. is, a, this, this is actually like an exacto knife. It just pieces. happens to be circular. Oh. But when I cut with a circular, and this is a lot thicker than it should be, if I cut with a circular rather than a flat blade, it, the, the force is always going down and not lateral. And so what happens is you end up cutting it rather oh, than yeah. ripping it. That's a much smoother uh, edge you got there than the other right, one. Right, right. So that's that's what you want to do. You want to be able to, to, to cut a nice clean edge. Otherwise, the, uh, the, the whatever you're trying to make, the, the mold is going to turn into that. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you don't want that. That's not, that's not really useful. Okay. So uh, what's now, your end game here, Padre? My end game, the reason why I started doing this is because I had this. Yeah. You this, have a quadcopter frame. Yeah, this is a quadcopter frame. If you take a look at it, it actually it fits onto this, like so. Uh, this buckles onto that standard 250 frame that we've been playing with, the one that we built for know-how. Yeah. But you'll notice that there's these little holes all over. Yeah. You could put these little grommets, these little vibration dampeners. They look like little balls mm -hmm. into those holes, and then you can put it into the top surface like that, and what happens is it becomes what's called a clean plate. So as the frame vibrates, this part stays steady, which right. is great for mounting cameras. Yeah, exactly. That's what we do with our GoPros. Right. <laughs> so I had a couple of unsuccessful <laughs> goes at it. This was the very first one. Actually, that's... Are these your prototypes? <laughs> these, these, I don't, I don't even want to call them prototypes. These are, <laughs> these are horrible. So uh, all I did for this one was I, uh, I actually just took out the, uh, the Instamorph and I put this on top of it. I just started pushing. Use pressure, yeah. and then you cut around the edges. And then I cut around the edges using my uh, my my uh, circular blade here. Uh -huh. It kind of worked, but what happened was it ends up being way too thick. I mean, this is good strength. Yeah. But it's it's incredibly thick when you compare it to the original. Not so useful. Uh, my second attempt was a little bit better, um, and my plan was to cut out the interior. Uh, and so I ended up with something that was much thinner, but it was still a bit too thick. Mm -hmm. uh, my my uh, third attempt, this is actually really thin. Yeah, this is the nice. same thick thickness as this. And the secret here was instead of pressing this down in order to flatten it, yeah. I had this on my cutting mat, and then I had another flat surface that I pushed down until it was the right length, the right size. Mm -hmm. 
and then I put this on top of it and cut around. Oh, uh, okay. It's like okay. Cu- cutting cookie dough. Yeah. Uh, now, this actually does work. So this, this if, I, if I could put the vibration balls in here, this is not great. <laughs> I, I had to use a Dremel tool to... Uh, to be, so. To make your uh, precision yeah. holes there. So, yeah, this... Uh, I, I think in the future what I want to do is I'm actually going to get some copper tubing that's the right size mm-hmm. so that I can make holes that don't look like they were made by a three-year-old. <laughs> uh, this works just fine, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's kind of ugly. Uh, now, I have, I have one more version, and unfortunately it was stuck in the mold. I couldn't get it out. But uh, it involved, I did make a mold, and then yeah. I pushed the Instamorph into it Beautiful, absolutely yeah. beautiful. I'm going to bring that in uh, hopefully for the next episode. Uh, but this just shows you what you can do with this. Now, the cool thing about this is, is these these are not wasted. I can you could just remelt them. Put that right back yeah. in and use them for again. something else. Yeah. That's uh, really cool. Uh, Anthony, we've got a couple of uh, links here. The first thing I would suggest that you get if you want to do some, uh, some more advanced Instamorph stuff, the first thing you need is a cutting mat. Uh, I've mm-hmm. got a link here. You can get different size cutting mats. And, and the reason is not necessarily because you want to protect the surface, although right. you do. Reason is, if you use a precision tool like this rotary cutter on like a tile surface, yeah, you'll blunt the blade, and as you blunt the blade, it's you start get to get harder and harder to cut stuff. Yeah, yeah. and also it will just it'll like it'll stretch instead of cut, which is that the whole reason purpose. why you're using it. Right. The okay. second thing is the rotary cutter. Pick one of these things up. These are great. This was about twelve bucks. Uh, it's a, a, a Fiskars. You can get larger ones or smaller ones depending on the kind of work you want to do. If you want to do long cuts get a larger blade. Mm-hmm. If you want to do really short and like tight cuts, yeah. you get a smaller blade. That's that's how it works, right? It's yeah. geometry. That's yes it is. Math. <laughs> uh, and then of course there's the Instamorph. So I got 34 ounces of Instamorph. It cost me, you know, under 40 bucks. Yeah. This is the same bottle we had for the first episode. I've used like maybe the top eighth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's going to last you a good long time. No, there's there's so many different things you could you do for this beyond you know I've been doing using it for art making like yep. my little sculptures and stuff, but the what more you, I what you making there, Brian? Well, I might make a little clay guy oh, right now, okay. but uh, unless you need to use it for something. No, no, no. 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 Uh, but the more I think about it, uh, the more I would like to use it for something like uh, my motorcycle. Yeah. Uh, because there are these, they're called sliders, and they're made out of this similar like plastic material, and just something to kind of like protect the parts of your bike that might come in contact with the ground. Now, if you're going really fast and you slide across the ground, nothing's gonna, no. plastic's just gonna you're, melt. You're gone. Yeah. But if you tip over in a parking lot or something like that, it would be nice to have something like this uh, on one of my yeah. like, on the handlebar, edge of the handlebar or something. It's yeah. super cheap, you can mold it the way that you want. Yeah. Uh, one other tip is you're always going to have excess because there's always going to be more Instamorph than you need it as you cut off pieces. You know, I just throw them back in the water. What I typically like to do is I'll go ahead and flatten it out into a skinny surface because if you make it like a ball, mm. it takes forever for it to remelt because the, te- the heat has to go from the outside in. Right. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's no fun. So it, while it's still malleable, like flatten it out <laughs> Or maybe even cut it into strips so that it'll be easier to melt the next time you want to use it. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the next time we want to use it, um, there was what? this thing that we used to do on Know How called Because We Can. <laughs> I thought that was every episode. Of uh, yeah, but, you know, there was you know, specifically things that had absolutely no productive use whatsoever. Okay. I was messing around with Instamorph and, uh, well... What did you come up with? Anthony, just uh, just run the video. Oh, dear God. Yeah. 
I should never have shown you where the extra bobbleheads were. Had I known what madness you would use it for. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I will say this. My, my original plan was to um, just put the bobblehead. I want to like cut the top off the bobblehead doll so that the head would bobble. Yeah. The problem is having something that weighs about 60 grams bobbling. Those things are heavy. Yeah. Those are kind of heavy and I, I was like, I, I think it's actually going to make the, the craft oscillate. I didn't really want it oscillating in the air. That would have that been a bad thing. So <laughs> I ended up instamorphing him to the frame. Uh, now, cool, cool thing. Uh, you can't just stick instamorph and then put the doll on top of it it's not right. like that so there's a cavity inside those bobble heads where the mm -hmm. spring goes up into so what i did was i, I used something like this so this is just a, a plastic nylon spacer along with a washer up top and a screw so that it, the instamorph would actually mold around this so that gives it something to grab right and then i pushed the entire assembly while it was still hot into the bobblehead doll so that it would expand inside the cavity and it, it and that thing's like concrete. It, nice. it ain't coming out. Yeah. Uh, and then down below, you can see the instamorph. I just use it to sort of flatten out because the head is tilted back yeah. and I needed it flat. So if I had to do it again, what I would have done is I probably would have colored it because it looks just like a white blob. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, at first I was like, cool. I was going to make a flesh color, but I'm like, I don't, that would be like a triple <laughs> chin. I don't think we want to do that. But uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, Instamorph, it'll, it'll probably get you fired. Yeah, yeah, it'll give you some ideas. Hmm. You know, speaking of ideas, Brian. Yes. I'm thinking uh, I've got an idea for what I want to do for a future episode of Know How. What's that? Home automation. Oh, yeah, we were talking about with the, some of the home automation we wanted to do, but I think there's an easier way, too. There's a much easier way. We've been talking about different ways to create products that will control your temperature or control the shades. But what if there was a product, something that you could just buy that would tie together all the different systems, all the different home automation products into one neat interface. It's just too bad that doesn't exist. Oh, wait, Padre, it oh, does. It, oh, that's right, it does, <laughs> and it's called Smart Things. Now, what is Smart Things? Smart Things is, as I said, a way to tie together all your devices. It lets you monitor, control, and automate everything. It's seen its highest rated home system ever. This is called Smart Things. Now, the, the Smart Things hub is what Brian's holding right now. That's the piece that ties it all together, be it oh, Smart Things devices, Smart Things hubs, Smart Things uh, sensors, or sensors and hubs and devices from, from other manufacturers. Now, you can light your house, you could lock your doors, you could control your thermostats and home security all in one place. Intuitive controls allow you to set the rules on your smartphone through their free iOS, Android, and Windows phone apps. With smart things, you can customize the way that your smart devices talk to each other. This is important. It's like IFTI. So now you can tap goodnight on your phone and the lights will turn off, the thermostat will adjust, and the doors will lock. In other words, you can set up exactly how you want your home to respond to events. You can even keep your home protected with Smart Things Home Security, which includes things like motion detection, water detection, and more. I like enabling my speakers to broadcast dogs barking. In fact, <laughs> I, I put the corgi sound. So if someone comes in and triggers my motion sensor in the front of the house, you know, at a time where we're supposed to be sleeping, they'll hear dogs barking. It's, it's fun things like that that give me control over my devices and, and my stuff. You could even set a camera to take a series of photos when unwanted motion or entry is detected. And you can have your doors recognize when you're close and have them unlock themselves as you walk up if you're carrying one of the Smart Things tags. There are so many different ways to customize your Smart Things home. I know you're going to love it. You've got to try it. Now, Smart Things was named CES 2015 Editor's Choice Award, and there's good reason for that. CES was filled with home automation, but those editors looked at it and they said, well, what if I want this to communicate with that? What if I want my thermostat to be able to interact with the locks? That's the sort of thing that SmartThings lets you do. And now, to get you started setting up your smart home right now, SmartThings is offering know-how listeners 10% off any home security or solution kit. And you get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. SmartThings, get smart, get now. And we thank Smart Things for their support of Know How. Uh, Brian, uh, we, we've been having a couple of questions from people who have a lot of networking issues, right? Right. And uh, one of the things that has been brought up more than once was this idea of baking your own router. We talked about you know, doing a, a nice customized build. But what happens if somebody wanted to, to take parts and make something that could do everything that they wanted? 
Right, kind of, you know, take con full control of their, their network. Yeah. Uh, to those people, we gave them a representative, Ben Reese. This is sort of like a feedback. And uh, Brian, uh, you want to read what Ben wants? So he asked, should he build his home build his own router? And there's been a lot of discussion about networks, routing, and using an old PC as a router. At what point is it less profitable to build your own PC-based router than to purchase a good router from someone like Cisco? For example, Ben presumes another solution for the issue addressed on the last episode would be to build their own router with a PC and a few NIC cards since you have plenty of memory for more IP addresses. Would an old Cord 2 Duo be more than enough to handle the traffic from 500 plus devices? It's a good question. Good question, and the answer is it depends. Dep <laughs> it depends. Oh, it's always complicated. I know, I'm sorry. Now, if you are looking at home building your router, there's really only one that I would suggest, uh -huh. and it's PFSense. PFSense has, has been developed for a, a, quite a while. It's got a lot of plugins. It's a fantastic operating system, and it does exactly what you want. It will it'll let you be as simple or as complicated as you want to get. However, there are a few things you need to know about this. Uh, one, it's going to suck up more power than a standard home router, right? Okay. So uh, and it, it, it can be considerable. Right now, energy prices are low, but you're looking at a home router that might take 10 watts of power Versus mm -hmm. this, which might be sucking down 100, 200, 400 watts of power. Uh, so you, you need to consider that. I mean, sure. is, is it economical for you to be running this all the time, sucking that much power? Now, balance that against some of the advanced features that you're going to get. Uh, we talked about subnetting. We talked about having more than 254 devices in your network. Mm -hmm. That's all possible with PFSense. Plus, it will give you some absolutely fantastic security. But here's what you have to do. Take a look <laughs> at the hardware you actually have. If you go ahead and go uh, jump back into that PFSense page, uh, Anthony, uh, there's, a, there's a, a minimum hardware requirements uh, over there. Now, memory, they say 256 megabytes is the minimum. That is the minimum. That's horrible. That's, you, don't, you want at least two gigabytes. Okay. If you don't have two gigabytes, yeah, you ain't running it right. Uh, they say the minimum for the CPU is a Pentium 3. A Pentium 3. Horrible. Uh, I, I would I would say no. I, <laughs> yeah. I would prefer a Core 2 core Duo, two duo. like, like yeah. you mentioned in your post. Uh, they also say that you need a one gigabyte hard drive. I actually prefer a one gigabyte compact flash card. Which isn't too Which too is hard too to bad. Yeah. Uh, or if the PC you have has USB 3, I would even say run it off a USB drive. It, it would be plenty fast enough. This is a lot like the, um, the FreeNAS installation that we made where once you've loaded up everything, it doesn't really do a whole lot of writes anymore. Right. So you're, you're okay. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you also need NICs. So you're going to need a minimum of two, right? You want mm -hmm. one for the WAN and one for the LAN. It's got to feed the inside. Right. Uh, stay away from Realtek. Realtek NICs in a PFSense box are horrible. If you can get them to work, the performance will, will be just terrible. Mm -hmm. What you want are Intel-based NICs. So get something with an Intel chipset. There's plenty of them. Uh, and they're, they're not that expensive. In fact, I just bought one. Mm -hmm. It was a it's server class, which is different because it means it has its own dedicated processor, so it offloads that from the CPU. Okay. And it had four gigabit ports, and I think I bought the thing for sixty seven dollars. Okay, so not um, too bad. Yeah, which is which is great because it, it allows me to really play with subnetting and you know going off to different networks. Hmm. Now, here's what you need to consider when you're actually building the box. There are performance classes that will require different amounts of hardware. If you've got it hooked up to DSL, so you're talking 10 to 20 megabits per second of throughput max, you can get away with an Intel Atom, like really low end, and a gigabyte of memory. But the faster your internet connection, the more powerful hardware you're going to need? Exactly. As you start to route more packets, as you start to support more devices, and as you start to add more features to the PFSense box, mm -hmm. you're going to need more CPU and memory to support that. The Intel Atom is literally, like, if there's three people on the network, that's, <laughs> uh, that's the only time I would suggest that solution. And, and again, that's 10 to 20 megabits. That's really on the low end of what we would consider broadband. The next step up is 21 to 100 megabits per second. So that's like a cable modem, right? right. Cable modem or, or, even, or even maybe a fast cable premium tier. There you need an Intel Core 2 Duo, I would say two gigabytes of memory. From there you go up to 101 to 500 megabits per second. That's super fast cable or Fios. Right, right. Uh, that, yeah. that, that'll get you like, like, for example, I know people down in Los Angeles can get upwards of 300 megabits per second. That's the internet I want. Right, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, minimum, I would say Intel i3. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want an Intel i3 CPU. You want, uh, I'd say, four gigabytes of memory. Plus, you're going to want a PCIe NIC. 
okay. because you're going to start actually stressing out the, uh, the the bus for the network card. Then there's the top tier. That's that's 500 megabits per second and above. So that's like Google Fiber, right? And okay. the, now let's say you're supporting the 500 boxes that the original poster was talking about. I'd say the minimum there is Intel i5. I would actually go Intel i7. Um, now we're getting pretty serious. Now we're getting pretty serious. I'd say you know eight gigabytes of memory is the minimum. I I actually would push more if if I can if I've got it. Yeah. Uh, and you definitely want an enterprise class NIC and an enterprise class NIC or network interface card will have that processor to offload a lot of the packet handling from the CPU. Okay. So basically what I'm gathering is if you do have old hardware laying around and your internet connection isn't that high of a tier, then it might be a good idea or you might be able to put something together with the cost benefits of not buying a full-on router? Or? Yeah, you know, see, that's, that was the part of the question. I mean, the first part of the question, can I build a home uh, a homebrew router? Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can do it. In fact, we're going to do it on the show. I promise you we're going to have yeah, a Yeah, it sounds PF like it'd be sense. a fun project. I just, I'm not sure, is it economical? I don't or? know. And not unless you do, you're doing something really freaky <laughs> with yeah. your home network. Uh, because you've probably not got more than 30 devices hooked up at your home. No. And you probably don't have a gigabit connection. No, I don't. Um, and, and I mean, it's fun to say that it's my box until something breaks and then you have to troubleshoot your box rather than just power cycling it. Yeah, well, the thing is, is if something happens to your router and you it's have you. to get on the internet to figure out yeah. what happened to it. Yeah, that's going <laughs> to be an issue. That would be uh, So I, I always tell people, uh, should, when they ask me, should I do it? I say, yeah, do it. Absolutely mm -hmm. do it. Play with it. I don't, you know, don't think that you're saving money doing it this way. Yeah, just, it would just be kind of a fun project. And you yeah. probably learn a lot doing it, too. Learning, and we're all about learning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to teach you how to make a PF Sense box. I've actually got parts on order so that we can, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm going to combine the PF Sense box with the oil uh, cooled PC. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. That would actually kind of cool. <laughs> Why not? You know what? Because we can. Well, one of these days, I want you to give me a, a good recommendation on a router because I, I have an old uh, Netgear Dude, that I want to get rid of. And it's, but then when I asked you for which one I should get, you're like, oh, don't get one yet. yet. Well, because you were looking at the, the Linksys, the AC. Which, yeah, the one that looks cool. It looks good. It doesn't, it's not, they it's not said they yet. were going to support open source on it. And they're not. And it doesn't really quite do it just yet. So I'm waiting for that. When, when they turn that on, that is the router to get. Okay. Uh, unless... Because that's like a $200 router, yeah. I think. Yeah. So keep waiting is what you're telling me. Or build my own router or in the meantime so that I How can How about this? When, when we build the oil PC PF Sense mm -hmm. router, you can take it home. <laughs> I just have to find somewhere that, you know... You well, can store a bunch of oil. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, there is one more thing I want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we're going to take you back to CES. The last two episodes, we took you to Epson, where we showed off their uh, augmented reality glasses, cool and then stuff. Lightshot, where we showed you an augmented reality game. I, I want to switch it up a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, 3D full body scans. <laughs> hey, Anthony, <laughs> push the button. Laser scanners are nice if you want to scan something small, a, a thumb-sized object. But if you want a full-body scan, something big, you could spend days and days and weeks and weeks profiling different photos, or you could spend 12 seconds in this 3D photo booth. Taking the picture is only part of the process because anytime you take a scan, there's going to be missing information. There's going to be pieces that are there that shouldn't be there. Anyone who's done any sort of scanning, 2D scanning, 3D scanning, whatever, is going to know this phenomenon. Well, what Artec does is they've got proprietary software that actually looks for those missing pieces. It looks for the holes. It looks for the things that probably should be there. Uh, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, but they've trained their software to know what the human body should look like. This is what the model looks like after it's done the first pass. So it's gone into grayscale and it's figured out all the missing pieces. Now, remember what it looked like in the full color. Now look at it, what it looks like in the grayscale. It has accurately figured out everything that needs to be added into the scan. Remember what this thing looked like when it first came out of the cooker and now it's added in so much of that missing information. It's even got my smirk. That's right, my 3D model is smirking, folks. And it's got my ass. <laughs> you should do the dance after that. Oh my! Uh, yeah. So, uh, th thanks wow. to the folks over uh, over at Artec. Very cool technology. And uh, one of the parts <laughs> that I really liked was mm 
Uh, I've seen in 3D tech where it does a pretty good approximation of everything, but yeah. then there are holes that have to go bit filled in right. before you can actually print it. Otherwise, it just looks like garbage. Their system is actually pretty smart about what it fills in. In fact, Anthony, if you go to my screen right now, they, they emailed this to me after the show. This is the actual 3D model. So, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Look, hey, it's uh, pre spot Pretty <laughs> accurate. Uh, yeah, that's actually even what my shoes look like. Uh, now, they, they have an option here where I can order a 3D print. I could actually uh, get them to print it up for me, or I could just download the 3D model. They're giving me the 3D model so that once we start having 3D printers on know-how, uh, we'll be able we to... We can print out Padres. We can print out as many <laughs> of them me as you want. over the studio. Oh, my god! Use them as little voodoo dolls. I, oh, you, actually, there, there might be a market for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's pretty hilarious. Uh, I like it, it. It's stuff like this. Where I, I think this is a major area for DIYers. This is going to be something that they're going to love to do because it really allows you to indulge uh, your creative imagination, the ability to scan anything and yeah. then make modifications to it. I, I think I spoke about this a couple of times during our CES 2015 coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that affordable 3D scanners are now right next to affordable 3D printers. We're getting there. Yeah, it means that I can I can do something like this and then and then improve the model, like you know, take off the fat. <laughs> well, you could make. Uh, I mean, if you really wanted to get artistic, you could make like a centaur version of yourself or something, yeah, or a bobblehead, or I a bobblehead of yourself. Bobblehead. Right, yeah. and that's the 3D model. So when they yeah. send you the 3D model, you can you can and manipulate the individual elements. Yeah. Uh, so, like, for example, there have been people who are complaining that I'm getting too dark, I must be using makeup. I could lighten <laughs> my skin tone. Uh, or, or, yeah. or I could enlarge my head, put it on a spring, and I got a bobblehead. Well, what I'd love to use it for is uh, if in conjunction with Instamorph or something like that, where I can, make, I can hand make something yes. pretty close to what I want, but if I were to try and just manipulate something on the computer, I wouldn't be able to get as close with that. 3D scan it, and then after that, just touch up you know, what I would want after that. Right, right. Uh, so look forward in future episodes of Know How. We've got a couple of companies who will be sending us their 3D printers. Still looking for someone to send us one of their uh, their decent 3D scanners. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to quite have the resolution of a full body scan, but for smaller objects, like mm -hmm. for example your claim hand, uh, you know, model it in Instamorph, scan it in 3D, make the fine tune adjustments, yep. and then and then 3D print the finished model. I mean that's. And then I can start selling my little clay guys. There you go. Or I can finally do the, the clay show that I always wanted to do. Little, little clay guys fighting. Mm. <laughs> I'll have to talk to Alex about that. Absolutely. He'll be my producer. Uh, now, folks, we know that this was a lot of information, uh, everything from the explanation of how PF Sense boxes work, and we're going to have a future episode to go in depth, to playing around with Instamorph. We're going to have links for absolutely everything. So if you missed anything from the show, don't worry, all you got to do is go to our show page and click on the episode, which, where can they find? That would be twit.tv slash kh, and uh, all our prior episodes live there. You can peruse through our, our copious amounts of links and show notes, or uh, if there happens to be an episode that catches your fancy, download it to your uh, favorite device. We've got a bunch of different ways to subscribe or uh, download, so... Choose your fancy, and then there's uh, also the Google Plus community. Yeah, you can't forget that. I mean, uh, it's got over 8,000 users now. Uh, yeah. It's very active. It's re I love every time I turn on my device, there's a couple more people posting. I'm like, mm -hmm. yes, this is, this is what we want. Go in there, post project ideas. You'll get a lot of suggestions, or look at the project suggestions that other members of the community have had and give them your input. That's what it's all about. We will pull at least a third of the show directly from that Google Plus group. So if you've got a project to show off, put it in there, yeah. it'll end up on the show. If you've got a question you want answered, put it in there, and we'll probably put it into a feedback. Yeah, we got it. We love hearing back from the fans and talking to everybody. And so. We used to have a link shortener, but you know what? That's always a pain in the butt. Just go to Google Plus and look for Know How. It's the only group out there. Jump in, join yeah. on, and start building. And I think if, even if you just go to YouTube and type in Know How, we pop up first. Yeah, yeah. Or at least your face is there. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> We're this, working This is on what mine. you're going with? Yeah. This? Okay. <laughs> uh, also, don't forget that if you don't uh, fall into the G Plus groove, you can always mm -hmm. find us on Twitter. That's a great place to find us. You'll find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at <laughs> PadreSJ. If you follow me, if you jump onto my page, 
you'll find out what we're going to be doing for every episode of every show I do on the Twit TV network. I always make sure I announce it ahead of time. Plus, you get to see what I do when I'm not on the show. Things like fly quadcopters with bobbleheads of Leo. I was going to say, if you follow Padre on Twitter, there'll be little Easter eggs for what's going to come up in the week. So. Uh, actually, in the group right now, there's uh, I, I, I put... Actually, scroll down a little bit. Scroll, keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. Boom, boom. So I put this picture up the other night. It was late. I, I couldn't sleep. There was a 24-hour <laughs> Home Depot near me. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to go build something. I like the speculation of what people are trying to figure out Some what you're doing. really good guesses in so, there. Potato gun, I think, was one of them. I, <laughs> I, I would love to build a potato gun. Yeah, but potato gun. But I mean, also, if you, if you scroll up a little bit, uh, you can see there's like the, the Dremels at the bottom. Actually, there's, there's clues all over this picture uh -huh. of what this is actually going to be. And there was one person in the G Plus group who yeah. actually figured it out. <laughs> so he knows what I'm building. Uh oh. Uh, but everyone else, pretty good guesses. Cool. Except yeah. for that one person who was he's like, hydrogen fuel cell for a quadcopter. Maybe. I wouldn't put. I wouldn't put it past you. Why not? That's uh, <laughs> but yeah, if you're if you're already on Twitter, you can follow me at cranky underscore hippo. And same thing. Lots of pictures of behind the scenes stuff that we do here at Twit. And uh, before we close the show, we gotta thank Anthony again. Yes, we do. Yeah. Don't forget, we've got to, uh, uh, NL three is not here today no. because. He hates you. That's why things ran so smoothly yeah, the, today. Yeah, that's actually what he told us. We're like, hey, we're doing a pre-record on Monday. He's like, I hate the know-it-alls. <laughs> yeah, he I does. Like, Alex, how could you he say does. that? Like, oh. I don't want to come in on my day off. Oh, no, no. But I thought so, he was a trooper. So instead of grumpy old Alex, we got Anthony Nielsen. Anthony, could you say hi to the folks? Hey, everyone. Yay. And you like there we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. This this is the man. This is the man who's uh, got the master plan. He also has a dog running around here somewhere. Oh yeah, somewhere. Yeah, actually he's sleeping there. behind me. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Anthony's basically the Batman of Twit. So. He really is. Yeah. He's not the TD that we deserve, but he's the TD that we need right now. So true. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Get up. <laughs> bow, 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 bow.